And we have to be able to rely on people who have a broader view. And one of those people is Adam Hartung. I'm really excited that he's here. He's been my friend for about 15 years now. And uh, he's the number one contributor to Forbes Online. He's been named one of the most influential social media people in Chicago. And he's consulted with companies all around the world about disruptive innovation and avoiding lock-in. So you're in for a treat. This is hard stuff. Tune in and let's all learn something together. Please welcome Adam Hartung. Thank you very much, Buckley, and thank you for inviting me to beautiful Madison, Wisconsin. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. The weather there is terrible. It's 70 degrees today. So it's a great, great pleasure that I'm here. Um, I come out here quite embarrassed. I have to admit, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Adam. I'm a recovering strategist. I say that because I've been at the work for about 30 years, maybe a little bit more than that, and if I went around and tried to do some kind of a poll with all of you as to what strategy means or what a strategist does, I'm sure I would get almost as many different answers as there are people in this room. In fact, a lot of you, when you heard the word that I'm a strategist, probably said, well, he's probably the best BSer that we have in the room today. Because <laughs> a lot of people in that field, that's where they came from. But I hope today what we can do is take a little bit of time to talk about what's gone on in the field of strategy and business strategy for the last 30 or so years and apply a bit of it to economic development because it does apply. And really what's important is to understand that as the field of strategy has developed, we've become quite a bit more insightful as to the role of innovation. If strategy's only been of practice for 35 years, which it has because it came about really with Michael Porter's book, Competitive Strategy in 1980, the study of innovation as an academic exercise has only been around for about 20 years when Clayton Christensen wrote The Innovator's Dilemma and got us all started thinking about how innovation can actually be applied. So it's a fairly new topic, but the nice thing is, is we've had a whole lot of insight and a lot of new information has come to the fore and we figured out how we can start to apply that in some really, really productive ways. Now, the first thing I have to admit to you is that because I come from a business background, I come from the notion that resources are limited. So my approach to economic development is that all of you have a limit on what you can do to try to encourage development in your communities. You don't have a bottomless pocket of money that you have to deal with. And that means you have to make choices. Where do you want to put your money? How do you want to place your bets? Not just choices in terms of how you might want to invest money in education, but actually I want to say you need to make choices about the kinds of organizations that you want to bring to your company, uh, to, your, to your community, excuse me. Not all companies are the same. Some will do really good things for your communities, some not so much. And if we sort that out and we place our bets in the correct way, I think you can find it can make quite a bit of difference. The first thing I want you to do is that we're going to take a poll here, and I want you to think about some companies and whether you would recruit these, which you would recruit to your community. So first of all, let's start with, would you rather have Amazon or Sears? Would you rather have Google or the Encyclopedia Britannica? <laughs> Would you rather have Tesla or General Electric? Hmm. First two seemed easy, right? Last one, not so much, you're thinking to yourself. In fact, some of you might be saying, Adam, if I have my way, I want them all. Get all six of them and put them into my community. So it's worth trying to take some time to think a little bit about what the difference is in these communities, in these companies, and perhaps how things developed and how that might apply to your decision making. Now to do that, I really need three volunteers that'll come up here and help me. I promise you won't have to sing or dance, yes. I need two more, please, come on up, come on up. Two more. Oh great, I need one more. Come on, there we go, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Adam. Hi, I'm Jim. Hi, Jim. Okay, Come on, no, no, excuse me. Oh, wow. <laughs> I like farm girls. Oh, okay. Am I out? No. I'm sorry. You're, oh. you're Paige? Paige. Nice to meet you. Naomi. Nice to meet you, Naomi. Naomi, I would like you to stand here. Okay. Jim, you stand right in the middle. Paige, you stand right there. That's excellent. Now, I said you wouldn't have to sing or dance. Didn't say anything about rope tricks. <laughs> there you go. You get the end. You get the end. And you get the other end. Now then, 
what I'd like you to do, <laughs> you hold your right hand with the rope around at your waist. And you hold that hand up around your shoulder. Now, make it tight. There we go. In the world of business, we make assumptions all the time. And the first assumption we had about business that came out of education was that growth was a linear line. So if you went back and you looked at the way they taught people to plan for their businesses back all the way up through the 1950s, it was to think of growth as a linear progression that we would add a little revenue all the time. And I need you to make your hand into pistols, Jim. Great, put it underneath the rope, raise it up. Now then, widen your hands way out. Way out, as far as you can go. Great, now make them level. And you drop your arms down just a little bit more. Great, a little bit more. There. Something happened, we learned, in the 1980s. And it was that growth didn't look like that at all. Coming through the, the, the exercises of the 1970s, we saw that growth kind of went up, but then it reveled out. And what we had was the emergence of the generals, right? General Electric, General Motors, General Dynamics. And the philosophy, the theory of business, became you need to grow, get big, and then consolidate. Create an oligopoly. Three companies is ideal. And these oligopolies we need to protect. Now, somewhere over here, some point, sometime, things are going to go bad. We don't care about that. <laughs> what we care about is how do we protect this part of the business? So that's where Michael Porter came along. He said, how do these companies maintain themselves as these great big companies? And he came up with ideas like the five forces model. Remember that? How to protect yourself from replacement products. How to re you know, protect yourself from substitutes. Now start taking your hands and bring them together towards your nose. So while we were studying all this, and Bain and McKinsey and the Boston Consulting Group were helping companies develop scale economies and entry barriers and show that they could not be competed against, unfortunately, all the way together, we started finding out that those companies didn't do so great. We get to the turn of the century and what we see is that companies were either growing or not. Sun Microsystems comes on the scene, makes Unix servers, can't grow fast enough. World gets enough Unix servers, goes out of business. Goes from nothing to $205 billion valuation, that takes 20 years. Loses all that valuation, 16 months. General Dynamics starts to struggle, goes on an acquisitions binge, tries to make sure it can retain its revenues. Year after year after year struggles to retain the revenues value just keeps slowly declining. So what we learned was that in fact, growth is a constant requirement. Now we've been able to replicate that looking at communities, looking at states, looking at nations. And what we see that you are either growing or you're dying. And that's a terrible realization to have. Because you'd like to just reach that sustenance state that sounded so good when Michael Porter told us all about it. When those economists told us that oligopolies were the greatest thing, it just felt good. Let me get an oligopoly in town. I don't have to worry about this stuff so much. But now we know it's not true. It's not true. Y'all have General Electric in Wisconsin. Got a lot of plants. What have we seen happen to that? Great, once wonderful company over the last five to 10 years, right? So now that's the first thing we learned about strategy. Strategy is something that has to focus on constant growth, not protection. It is impossible to protect a business. Gee, why is that? So you can put your hands down, Jim. Great, thank you. This is an exercise, you feeling better? <laughs> Good. Okay, back to the original format, yeah, ladies. Hand up, hand down. So the next thing we had to address was talking about change. How does change happen? And we realized that we'd always thought about change like this, a linear process. You know, and you remember the TQM movements that we had in the 1970s? They came along and said that the, the, the two companies, Toyota and Honda, managed to wreak havoc on an entire automotive industry just by implementing quality. If you put quality in place and you try to improve your job a little bit every quarter, the long term will take, out of, take care of itself. Wow, does that ever sound good? And so we get some companies that go forward with the most ambitious quality program you've ever heard of, Six Sigma. Remember that? 
Measure everything. If you measure everything and you improve everything, nothing can go wrong. There was one company out of Chicago that championed Six Sigma harder than any other. They championed it so hard they created a school for Six Sigma and they offered that schooling to other companies at little or no charge. They would teach you how to implement Six Sigma and thereby you would be a forever successful company. Do you remember who that company was? Motorola. Wow, maybe quality isn't the only answer, right? So back to your pistols. Now this time, put the left hand over the top. There we go, right hand over the top now. Yep. Finger over the top. There you go. Put your other hand the way you had it. There, now drop the right hand down. This is what change looks like. Long periods, sometimes not so long, depending on the industry you're in, to be honest, of incremental improvement. And that whole total quality thing, Sounds really good when you're here. But then something big happens. So you have Motorola that creates the cell phone business. The leaders, you know, they, they created those radios that got us through World War II.